السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام ورحمة الله. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من والاه. So سبحان الله our Ramadan started with a shahada and it's been every single day and night. We've been giving shahada after Dhuhr, after Asr, after Isha, uh, after Tarawih, before the late night. And Alhamdulillah, in our last night we had Joel join us, Brother Joel join us. Is he still here by the way or Joel go home? All right, so we had Brother Joel take Shahada with us at Isha, and inshallah we have our last, maybe our last uh, Shahada for, for Ramadan, uh, Brother Jeremiah, who is here. So inshallah, I'm going to ask you actually if we can stand up, inshallah. Stand right in the middle. Bismillah. All right, are you ready? All right, alhamdulillah. So if you'll just repeat after me, we're going to go in Arabic and then English. Uh, in Arabic, very slowly, say, Ashhadu. أن لا إله إلا الله و أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his final messenger. So that's like beer. Congratulations. That's it. Welcome to Islam. May Allah bless you, keep you firm, forgive you for all of your previous sins, accept all of the good that you've done prior to this and beyond. So we want to welcome you home, inshallah. Uh, this is a box, a small gift from us to you. And everyone, all these brothers are going to hug you after we finish the class, inshallah. So if you don't want to be hugged, I suggest you get out of here before two. <laughs> Right. Welcome to the community, Jeremiah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And uh, Sheikh Yasser has an office for you <laughs> and a parking spot. Anywhere you see Yasser Burjas is yours. Congratulations. Good to see you. Welcome to the community. Welcome home. <laughs> On that note, Sheikh, someone gave me an Eid gift. How come I didn't get one? So, my new favorite sweater. Okay. Are you going to zoom on this thing? Can you see it? Yeah. Bismillah. Take this inside. Yes. <laughs> so they can see for, for real. MashaAllah. The only thing missing is an arrow that points to you. Because huh? <laughs> in Islam, we don't believe in ambiguity. No. So, he is, is it's he, him. <laughs> Sheikh Yasser. <laughs> I stole my office. <laughs> I thought my Trump jokes was bad. Zakamallah khair, Sheikh. We, alhamdulillah, enjoyed our time together and uh, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us in Al Firdaus al A'la, Ya Allah, Amin, to join us in paradise. And everyone who's here, Rabbil Alameen. Amin. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Tonight is uh, the, the, the last night of this month of Ramadan. It's the 30th night of Ramadan as we uh, uh, come to the conclusion of this beautiful series from the Valley Ranch Islamic Center. We were discussing the book of Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, Adda'u al dawa the disease and the cure. We went through a, a lot of these, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I would say, symptoms of the disease and, and how it happens and why it happens. And we spoke about so many subjects, Sheikh, you know, in regards to the, the, the disease, how it, how it occurs in the heart and, and why people continue to uh, go into the same old habits and what we can do to recover. So I believe that tonight, the best we could do is to give the people, inshallah, a message of hope. A message of hope in regards to, okay, alhamdulillah, I understand now. I know what the problem is. And I know that, that the cure is going to be uh, uh, maybe a little bit, um, requires a lot of discipline, a huge sacrifice, and uh, um, to, to remain steadfast, which is what we call al istiqama in the Arabic language. And I believe that everybody understands that when it comes to the istiqama, that's the soul of truly being a Muslim. A man, um, a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, قال يا رسول الله قل لي في الإسلام قولا لا أسأل عنه أحدا بعدك Tell me something about Islam that I don't have to ask anybody after you. And I believe subhanAllah it's very interesting now that we, we begin with this hadith with Jeremiah right now give it a shahada. So this is his mess the message from the Prophet وسلم, to him and to everybody else over here. So the man is asking, يا رسول الله I, I want to ask you the simple question. I don't have to ask anybody else after that. So tell me something about Islam that I need to hold on to and no one else, I have asked no one else. So the Prophet said, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ 
say, I believe in Allah, and then remain steadfast. What does that really mean, in essence? He's, he's telling him, say, I believe, and then prove it. Like basically, as the Prophet says, I challenge you, I dare you. Like he says, like, say, I believe, and then prove it. How would you prove to be a believer here? Is by remaining steadfast, having that sense of istiqama. Right. This is a thing that we all ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single rak'ah in our salah. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. So, istiqama is the essence of the cure for all the diseases that we talked about over here. So, I want to hear from you, inshallah, ta'ala, in the recap of the sessions, yeah. these sessions, and, and what is istiqama? How can we explain istiqama to the people? It's actually, subhanAllah, one of the most profound concepts in Islam. Because Islam anticipates the challenges ahead. It doesn't sell you a false hope. It doesn't mm. tell you, hey, you just believe and everything is going to evaporate. All your problems are going to go away. Nothing bad is going to happen. You're going to get rich. You're going to find ease in every single element of your life. Islam tells you, <laughs> After you say you believe, Allah is going to test you in your belief. Mm. Tests are going to come to make sure that that belief is sincerely for Allah. So the opposite of istiqama, and sometimes this is what our scholars of Tazkiyah do, is that they introduce a concept by its opposite. No. The opposite is what Allah mentions in the Qur'an, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفِ There are some people that worship Allah on an edge, like literally standing on a cliff. Hmm. If good things happen, they stay on. Bad things happen, they jump off. Oh. Right? So you're not just on a slippery slope, you're literally on a cliff, which means you put your faith in such extreme trepidation and you know and, and instability that you know it's either all or nothing you either jump off the cliff or you stay on the mountain right? so, they're, so they're testing God right and they're not really trying to be they're not being faithful to him subhanahu wa ta'ala they're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their terms not his terms like right. being on the edge if God is good to me I'm gonna be good to him right. if God is not so good to me then I'll leave Right. So that's, that's, I guess, that's like I said, that's completely opposite from the istiqamah. And when the man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, what is it I need to know about Islam that I need to hear it from you? He goes, say I believe, and then just prove it. Prove it, of course, but through the, the, the actions of istiqamah. Right. Now, when people ask, okay, so how can I be mustaqim? Right. I need to have that path of istiqamah. Uh, what is it exactly? How does it look like? So it starts with the heart. The Prophet Sallallahu most frequent dua, his most frequent supplication was what? Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. This is the most frequent supplication of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O turner of hearts, make my heart firm on your path. Mm. If there was anyone that wouldn't have to worry about his heart, it would be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he kept on saying and he taught, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O turner of hearts, make my heart firm on your path. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the heart in multiple ways. Right? In general, the word qalb, of course, means that it turns over, right? The taqallab, it's constantly turning over, upside down, upside down, upside down. The Prophet ﷺ described the heart like a feather in the desert. The wind blows it and it goes this way and it goes that way. It turns over this way and turns over that way. So the idea here is number one, you gotta ask Allah to make your heart firm. Number two, make sure that you don't keep exposing your heart to a tornado, right? So you can't control the volatile nature of the heart but you do control the type of environment that you put your heart in. So if the wind, if it's constantly storming, it doesn't matter how strong the house is initially, eventually our tornado is gonna to take it out. Mm. Eventually, the heart's gonna flip. So if you start from the heart, put the heart in the right place, and that's where SubhanAllah the ulama mentioned, like the scholars mentioned, it's deeply profound. I've been, um, if, if you've been Muslim for 60 years and you still have to ask Allah 17 times a day, guide me, guide me, guide me, guide me. Someone says, well, I'm already guided. But what does Surah Ali Imran come up with? So Surah Al-Baqarah is value guidance. Don't sell your guidance for nothing, right? Don't sell. Don't purchase misguidance for guidance. Don't, don't take your religion for a few pennies and just get rid of it like that, right? Take guidance as the most precious thing in the world to you. But Surah Ali Imran is, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Oh Allah, don't let our hearts become crooked after you've guided us. Because sometimes deviation comes after guidance. Sometimes crookedness comes after, after guidance. So Sirat al-Mustaqim is a constant straight path. Now all of us are going to, like if you tell someone walk in a straight line, or walk, go from here to there, go straight, 
Yeah, you know, your footsteps are going to be a little bit here sometimes, a little bit there. But if I tell you walk from that door to here, right? You know, think about a, think about a cop doing one of those tests. Not that I've ever had to take one of those tests, right? You know, like get, getting pulled over. For, like if, if the variation is too far off, that means you don't know where you are anymore. You've lost it. You've lost it. So it's natural that you're going to step a little bit here, step a little bit there, that you're not necessarily, t you know, tippy-toeing on a tightrope here. You're trying to walk as straight as possible, but if you're all over the place, you have no aim. You're not going where you need to go. So istiqama starts off with knowing the goal and then setting the structure, setting the environment in accordance with that goal. Then after having a firm heart, subhanAllah, this is, this is where I think it ties in beautifully to the book, Sheikh, is like every other element that you have. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi described every part of your body as, as having the potential to wander. It's mm -hmm. so like when he described the tongue, he said, don't have a tongue like, like the tongue of a, a cow, like slaps in different directions or something like that, right? Like keep your tongue firm, imprison it. You know, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, I believe it was him who said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, did not create anything without purpose. He said, Allah created two gates for the tongue, your teeth and your lips. Keep your mouth shut sometimes. Don't let your tongue slip right and left and just say whatever it wants to all the time. Allah talks about the wandering eye in the Quran. Talks yeah. about the aimless si uh, listening, right? So all of wasa'il al ma'arif, these things that you're supposed to come to know Allah by and make firm and have discipline with, mm. you just let them go all over the place. And so it's the most attractive seller and at any moment you can be a vulnerable buyer. And so yeah. the shaitan will take your heart somewhere, take your eye somewhere, <laughs> Take your ear somewhere, take your tongue somewhere, take your head somewhere. So keeping it firm, starting with the heart and constantly knowing where you want to go and then asking Allah to help you get there while you put everything in place so that you can get there, inshallah. You know, the best example for what you just said, Shaykh, that's summarized by the Prophet in one single hadith. When he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set forth an example for the believers in terms of istiqama and steadfastness. He goes, a straight path. Obviously, when I say istiqama, something mustaqim, you can see, you can see, alhamdulillah, that, that, I don't want to say the end of it, but at least you can, it's clear, the path is clear. If it was crooked, you're going to always be anxious because you don't know what's behind that, that for example, that curve and that, that turn. But it's straight, so everything's supposed to be clear. As you walk, it's still clear. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala set forth the example of istiqama, steadfastness, the example of a straight path. Because that's what you ask Allah all these days and all these salawat. Ihdina surat al-mustaqim, God us a straight path. He says, on the side of that straight path, there are walls. So there are fences and walls. He says, these walls have open gates. And these open gates, they're only covered with, um, with a sheet, not even actually a door. Just like saying, it's not even blinds, it's just simply like a curtain, which means that when the wind blows, it's going to open it. So these walls now had all these openings, and they're covered with these curtains. He goes, and as you walk through that path, there are two, two callers come to you. The caller from above and the caller that is ahead of you. He said that as for the straight path, that's the path that leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for these girts, for these doors or walls actually, or these fences, these are the limits, the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we've been talking about all these past nights. These holes or these openings in these walls are maharimullah, the sins that oh Allah had made subhanahu wa ta'ala haram and, and prohibited. And the, look at this, the metaphor over here. These are open doors, uh, or, or actually openings in the walls, and there are no gates, which means it's easy to go through. If the wind blows, or even if you just pull that curtain, you can easily go through it. This is how temptation can, can take the person away from the path of guidance. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as for the caller from above, um, that is a caller that keeps telling you, لا تفتحه إنك إن تفتحه تلجه. That's now he said that's your conscious. That's your conscious keep telling you, don't open the door or don't, don't pull that curtain. Because if you try to, to, to sneak a peek, you're going to go through. Like it's so tempting that even trying to test yourself, you might think of yourself too strong for this. You go, no, Alhamdulillah, no, I don't do these kind of things. Be careful with that thought. Be careful. Don't let the shaitan deceive you and say, no, you're too strong, you're good. You're okay, you can do that. You can, it's, it's fine, you'll be fine. I know you, you're not going to actually get involved in these things like everybody else. No, you know your limits. Shaitan can deceive you with that. Because, because if you're going to pull that curtain, certainly you're going to go through it. 
And the caller from above, from at the head actually of that path, he said, that's Al-Quran. So Al-Quran is keep telling you, keep going straight, wala tata'awwaju fi, don't take these turns. The Quran is telling you how to go straight on this path. But, and you have the caller that keeps reminding you every time you slow down because I hear something interesting behind this curtain. Wow, this is uh, fascinating. Oh, that's a beautiful voice. Let me check what's going on there. Then that caller says, don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah, it sounds, sounds very appealing, so sweet, so nice. But if you open it, you're going to get off that path and you're going to go somewhere else. And God knows how long this person is going to take in there before they go back again to the straight path one more time. And when they come back, Sheikh, like we said in the hadith, they're going to come back to that path with whatever is left of their iman. So that's the, the Prophet summarized the meaning of istiqamah in one single hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the opposite is taqwa. Nah. Like the analogy of taqwa, of piety, God consciousness, which is what Ramadan was supposed to develop in you for the last 30 days. Mm is a person walking between thorny bushes and making sure not to get pricked by a thorn. So you got one guy that's like, I wonder what's behind that curtain. And you got another person that's like, I don't even want to get pricked by that thorn. Mm. And so this kind of goes to like the motivation of pleasure and pain. No. So the pain of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter is greater than the pain of restraining yourself or enduring harm for obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. The pleasure for worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter is greater than any type of pleasure that anything else can give you in this life. So you have to kind of sometimes hear the pain, you've got to hear the pleasure. So when the Ansar would said to the Prophet ﷺ, look, we're going to lose our alliances, we're going to, you know, people are going to try to kill us, we're going to endure this, we're going to endure that. What do we get in return? Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said paradise, one, one word, you get Jannah, the pleasure of paradise, right? Paradise is always the answer. Jahannam is always the answer, right? To where you need to be motivated by those two things. But at the end of the day, what's the driver? And this, this really brings it back, subhanAllah. Because if you were to, to draw that out or, or create a plane, right? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah gave the most famous example. He said that you have the wing of hope and the wing of fear. But what's the body? What's the actual plane? What's the engine? The love of Allah. Remember we said the worst thing you can lose is Allah himself. The best thing you can gain is Allah Himself. Even more than Jannah, even more than Anar, Allah Himself. So the body of the plane is the love of Allah. The wings are hope and fear, and you've got to use them accordingly to keep yourself balanced. And so when the turbulence starts to hit, you know, you move in the right way. And we deal with a lot of turbulence. Every example with planes just resonates with me these days. Subhanallah. Everything has to do with a flight now because it's like everything about taqwa, everything about ihsan, you can learn it from a plane. <laughs> but Shaykh, can I, can I say one more thing, subhanAllah, just so we can introduce this as part of the discussion. No. We said the Prophet ﷺ was the person who had the least to fear. Mm. But one of the most famous ahadith of istiqamah or narrations about istiqamah is narration of Ibn Abbas when he says that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq noticed that the Prophet had some gray hairs. And it wasn't, you know, the Prophet died and he had 17 gray hairs. Like he, did, he wasn't someone with a lot of gray, alayhi salatu wasalam. Suddenly, he had these patches of gray here and here. So Abu Bakr, who loves the Prophet noticed and he said, Ya Rasulullah, qad asra ilayk shayb I see you suddenly going gray. What is it? And he said, Shayyabatni hud wa akhawatuha. Hud, Surah Hud, and its sisters. In the Arabic language, Akhawatuha means those that are like it. Right? Like Maryam was called Ya Ukhta Harun, O sister of Aaron. Right? Mary, the sister of Aaron. Not because she's the biological sister, but because Bani Israel considered Aaron, Harun, to be the fallen one. So they were likening Maryam to Harun. So Hud and its sisters, what are they? In another narration, the Prophet said, Al Waqi'ah, Al Mursalat. Surah al Naba, Surah al Taqweer, these surahs, these chapters that speak about the hereafter in such vivid detail. Such vivid detail. And some of the scholars said, What verse was it? The verse in Surah Hud, Fastaqim kama umirt. Be firm as you have been commanded. It's one of the most comprehensive verses in the Quran. Fastaqim, be firm as you have been commanded. Bima umirt means everything that's been given to you, O Messenger of Allah, you have to be firm upon it. Everything of its good of its hardships, everything, be firm upon it. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ As you have been commanded. Meaning what? You're not in charge of yourself. Allah is the one who commands. 
وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكَ And those that have turned back with you, وَلَا تَطْغَوْ Don't swerve. Don't swerve. Don't crash. إِنَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ Allah sees you. Doesn't that tie in so beautifully to like the last nine nights if you think about it? We said the vision of Allah, the sight of Allah upon you should be your greatest motivation. To obey Him and to not just obey Him, but to glorify His sight upon you. To want to do even more. Don't just like to be afraid from him as well to, have, to have shyness from Allah and then to honor Allah's sight upon you. This is the graduation from taqwa to ihsan. Taqwa, you're aware of the sight of Allah upon you to the extent that you'll be uncomfortable disobeying Him. Ihsan, excellence, you glorify the sight of Allah upon you to the point that you start to do extra good deeds because you're loving His sight upon you. So it's a graduation of sorts, right? From taqwa to ihsan. And this is such a comprehensive verse. Prophet is saying, that's what gave me some gray hairs. Like it stressed me out because that's a heavy command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be firm. Stay no. the course. No matter what happens, you have to stay the course. So staying the course doesn't mean that you can't make mistakes. Many people probably might think that, look, this seems to be very difficult. I mean, how am I going to be able to graduate from taqwa to ihsan? I'm, I'm barely even, not even close to taqwa to begin with, right? Alhamdulillah, we have hope in hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, qal saddidu wa qaribu. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is guiding us. He says, saddidu which means he knows that we're not going to be perfect. He knows that we're not going to always hit the target every single time. But he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Saddidu wa qaribu, which means you need to aim at your target and hit as close as possible to the, to the center, which is basically the bullseye. As, as close as possible. This should always be your, your way of, of uh, achieving things in this life. Like you want to uh, start, alhamdulillah, after Ramadan, uh, a path of uh, Ramadan uh, uh, lifestyle. What does that mean? I want to fast regularly. So I fast Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, instead of fasting every other day right away because that might be too much, too much for me. I'd rather go actually every other day. Um, maybe every other day is too much for me. In this case, I would do Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, maybe that's still also too much. So then I would start maybe with three days a month, building the habit towards that. Similarly, when it comes to the subject of uh, um, uh, salah, tahajjud, that doesn't mean you're going to start making tahajjud every single night because, alhamdulillah, I have a momentum from Ramadan. Saddidu wa qaribu. And similarly, if you, if, you, if you do something wrong, part of the tasdeed is returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tawbah and try to make it as sincere as possible, to return to Allah as, as close as possible to hit the target. So because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, He knows that you're not that perfect human being. You're not that perfect uh, uh, creation. But what He loves from you, the perfection that you bring into your ibadah, is actually returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with repentance. So that gives us hope. So that everybody can get that level of istiqama, but we just need to do our best. Just do our best. And doing your best requires, of course, knowledge. Requires from you to learn how to do it right. You don't just guess and then say, well, I was trying, I did my best. How do you know this is your best to begin with? Right. What can't you reach your best potential by getting yourself up there, inshallah, ta'ala, by thinking better about yourself, inshallah, Azza wa Right. And that's, so, the hope and the fear. No. The fear part is what Uthman radiallahu anhu said, that if faith and alcohol exist together, one of them is going to expel the other eventually, if they mm. coexist, right? Mm. When he's talking about al-kaba'ar, major no. sense. So he said... If you leave al-iman wal khamr, one is just going to knock the other one out eventually. You're going to have to make a choice. Al-iman was zina, you're going to have to make a choice. Faith in adultery, you're going to have to make a choice. When it comes to like the major sins, one of them is going to overcome the other if you let them coexist. Shut those doors, and then you have the natural stumbles, right? But you shut the doors of major sins and expect that you're going to make some mistakes. But then here's the hope part. There's no such thing as like a salvage title in mm. Islam on a soul. Mm. So you could come back from the most catastrophic major sin just like that, right? If your tawbah is sincere enough, as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, istighfar cuts the long journeys quickly, right? <laughs> you just, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk. You know, when a GPS reroutes, right? It's, you're not in trouble, you know? Like you can get ahead because it literally takes a moment of sincerity. I mean, subhanAllah, by the way, my, I, I thought of my Eid khutbah. Bismillah. The title of my Eid khutbah is Stop Being a Baby. I'll talk, but, I, but she, I'll just have to do it then. So anyway, what kind of title is that, I'll man? explain it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man, it's an inspiring... <laughs> but 
this idea gonna, of coming are, close to your Are you going to wear that, uh, that sweater on the, the, the member? I'm thinking about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, subhanAllah, we talked about this man, and there's a reason why I so emphasized the man who killed 100 people. Mm. There's no major sin worse than murder. Nothing. And subhanAllah, he did it 100 times. And all he had to do was show Allah that he was willing to reroute. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. So Ramadan is like expressing the intention to reroute. Mm. That's from major sin. For everybody else, again, where if, if, if you aim for 80%, you're going to fall to 60. If you aim for 60, you're going to fall to 40. Aim higher. So I want to have istiqama with reading the Quran. Mm. That's a lofty goal. It's different from someone. I want to have istiqama from quitting something terrible. Mm. But it's still istiqama at the end of the day. It's can you stay the course? Can you stay the course? Can you stay the course? And you need Allah to make your heart firm to be able to do that. But you've got to give Allah your heart before you can ask Him to make it firm. No. So give, present your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, make it firm on your path. And then I will do everything I can to have the right wind around it so that it can, it can stay stable and, and, no. and I'll feed it the right things. You know, uh, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, explained what you just mentioned. Also, again, something beautifully visual. He goes, look, when it comes to the subject of istiqama or hidayah, guidance, he goes, there are three levels of guidance. There are three levels. He says, hidayatun ila sirat, to be guided to go True. onto the straight path. Like the beginning is that you start right now, you move from outside of the path, the straight path, onto the straight path. So some people, they lived a completely sinful life, ignoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, completely neglecting Allah azza wa jal. So their heart was completely detached. And then like I said, they rerouted themselves, alhamdulillah, in a moment of sincerity. And now they're jumping back again to that straight path. Maybe they were behind these doors. You know, those walls that we explained in that straight path. They went in one of those walls and God knows why they went through that. And then somehow they find their way back again, alhamdulillah, they saw the light and they went through that wall, through that door, and now they're back on the straight path. So he says some people, the first step for them is to go from outside of the sirat to be on the straight path. But then is there, a is there any guarantee for them to stay on that straight path? The answer is no. And that's why he said the second level of guidance is hidayatun ala sirat, that Allah will guide you to stay on the straight path. So the first is to bring you to the straight path. So Ramadan could be, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, is the opportunity to reroute yourself and say, you know what, alhamdulillah, I find it so sweet and beautiful to be like this. I want to continue in this path of my life. I want to continue to fast, I want to continue to do good deeds, I want to continue to come to the masjid, I want to continue with this. So now you're on a straight path, you're enjoying it. But trust me, the shaitan is not going to let go of, of, uh, of his ways and, and attempts to take you off that path. Because that's what he said, he vowed. He says, قال, قال, لقدن, لقدن he says to the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will sit on the straight path. Like on that straight path that you have, you're showing them, I'll be sitting there. And I will come to try to seduce you, to try to tempt you, to try to take you away from there. He says, I'm going to come from, their, from the front of them, from behind them, from the right side, from the left. Like I'm going to be surrounded them with all these temptations and all these evil thoughts and waswasa. All of that stuff to take you off the straight path. So just because you're on the straight path, don't fool yourself and feel this Ramadan was exceptional. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Really, I enjoyed it. Alhamdulillah, I think this is it. I found my moment. So from now on, I'm going to be, inshallah, doing well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that from you and make it true. Amen. But the shaitan is clever. Yeah. He's not going to let go of this. So the third level right now, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, says, قال, So you have guidance to the straight path, guidance to stay on the straight path, and now guidance to go through the straight path. What does that mean? In order for you to stay balanced, if you, if you, if you ever actually exercise, you know, bicycling, for example, how do you stay balanced? How do you stay actually uh, uh, moving forward? You keep pedaling. If you stop doing that, what happens? You lose balance and you fall. The exact same thing. You're on the straight path. You found your way back, alhamdulillah, in Ramadan. And now, mashallah, you want to stay on this. What do you need to do? Keep pedaling. What did you do in Ramadan to make you feel so great? What did you do in Ramadan to make you feel, alhamdulillah, the light of guidance is coming back to me? What did you do? What are these beautiful actions that made you feel that way? You need to continue with them. Because if you don't, 
you're going to lose the balance and you will fall. And eventually, easy for you to go and see, let me take a break or take a, go through this door, for example. And that's it. You're out of that straight path. So be careful. Bringing you from outside to the straight path. Keeping on the straight path and going and growing through that straight path. Sheikh, uh, if we can reflect for a bit. Actually, if I was to ask you, who's the one companion that this hadith does not apply to? The shaitan having a bunch of doors open and calling them from each door. Oh, Amr al-Khattab. Amr al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Amazing. The Prophet said, Umar radiallahu anhu has reached the level. Shaitan, not only will shaitan not show up on his path, shaitan won't even be seen on the same path as Umar. He, Umar goes on a path, shaitan takes another path altogether. He's like, no, I'm not messing with that guy. What happens? And it actually manifests these three levels. Like, uh, you know, subhanAllah, for those of you who might remember, I used to teach behind the scenes with Al-Maghrib. I used to say, Umar radiallahu anhu is the most successful Tazkiyah experiment mm. in like history. Like if you just study a turnaround, this guy was all over the place. I mean, shaitan had him under his reins. He had him, right? Umar radiallahu anhu used to go out and drink every night. One night, he couldn't find his drinking buddies. He said, let me go do tawaf. Shows up, sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he says, let me hear what he's trying to say. He goes behind the Kaaba cloth to listen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reciting, let me hear what he's saying. And Umar radiallahu anhu goes to himself, he says, this is beautiful. He says, he must be a, a sorcerer. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recites, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ That this is not the words of a sorcerer, little do you believe. He says, how did he know that, right? Maybe he's a poet, or وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرِ Sorry. First he said, these must be the words of a poet. SubhanAllah. May Allah accept you, Rabbi. As the rain is coming down, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and accept from us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Amen. reward us and to have mercy upon Amen. us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us. Amen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us acceptance Amen. on this night of Ramadan and accept Amen our Amen. entire month of Ramadan, all of its Amen. ibadah, Amen. to grant us forgiveness Amen. and to grant our brothers and sisters victory in Palestine. Amen. Allahumma Amen. 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 Alhamdulillah, as we, you know, we're, we're witnessing all of this, it's obviously good for us to interact with this. Um, Umar radiallahu anhu hears the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa recite, these are not the words of a poet, little do you believe. And he says, he must be a sorcerer, how could he tell what I was saying on the inside? And then, وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ These are not the words of a sorcerer, Little do you remember. Umar radiallahu anhu at that moment, he could have come out from under the, the cover of the Kaaba, hugged the Prophet sallallahu and said, I believe. But instead, first, he had a conversation with shaitan. What did shaitan tell him to do? Shaitan told, like he basically sat with him and he said, this religion stuff is really starting to mess with my mind. You know what, let me go kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Let me just get rid of him. Problem solved. If I kill him, I won't have to think about this anymore. And we know what happens next. He goes out to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sends him a distraction. He goes and he gets into this whole brawl, right? With his brother-in-law and his sister. And he reads the Qur'an. He takes the time to read the Qur'an with a different heart, with a different perspective. Now at that moment, when Umar radiallahu anhu read the Qur'an, and he read Surah Taha, if Umar said, you know what, let me go home and think about this for a few nights. There's a possibility, right, that shaitan would have got back in his head and said, man, this guy has really got you deep. This Qur'an is messing with your head. But what does he do? He says, take me to Muhammad Wasallam. This time I'm going to go and believe in him. He goes to him. He believes in him. And the same man that was going out to kill the Prophet Wasallam now comes out to Quraysh and he's, he's like, who's, who's, uh, who's the social media guy of the day? Like, how do I get this out? Word quickly, I became Muslim. Like he's like, go ahead and shout to everyone that I became Muslim. He goes and he knocks on Abu Jahl's door, tells Abu Jahl that I became Muslim. Like he's like looking for a fight. <laughs> he's like, anyone have a problem with me being a Muslim, come fight me. You know? Now here's the thing. That could have all just been an emotional thing, right? He became Muslim, he got guided to the path, he had a moment. No. From that day onwards, Umar shut every door of the shaitan systematically to where shaitan completely lost his impact on Umar radiallahu anhu, to where he was so dedicated to the truth that even when the truth was against his desires, if Allah said it, right? So the same one, he was coming to the Prophet sallallahu and asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is Allah, is Allah going to say anything about drinking? Like I know in my heart drinking is wrong. 
he's pushing for the prohibition because he knows that his soul desires it, but Allah doesn't want me to do it. I know that Allah doesn't want me to do it. So he becomes al faruq the one who distinguishes truth from falsehood naturally because his natural intuition is to want good. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him that when you take a path, the shaitan just takes another path now. Shaitan's like, I'm going to go mess with someone that I think I can actually win. This guy is gone. Why? Because he's never interested in what's behind the curtain anymore. He's always interested in the caller ahead. The curtain is not appealing. The voice is not appealing to him anymore. I'm not going to waste my time with this man anymore. Let me go disturb other people who I can maybe win over and get them to come to my shop because he's gone. SubhanAllah. No, um, I love Amr al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wa SubhanAllah, since I was a, a, a young, yani young kid, reading the story of the Sahaba, I've never felt so much attracted to someone's personality and charisma like I did to Amr al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wa So, uh, which is why, I named my, my, not you, I named my you son. You love me that much, right? Isn't oh, that's why you love me so much, because I'm You remind me of Umar bin Khattab, right? <laughs> <laughs> Greatest no, but, compliment. Wallah, subhanAllah, Umar bin Khattab, the qualities of Umar radiallahu ta'ala to be mulham, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires him, really to that level, radiallahu anhu wa His bravery, when everybody, when, during the Hijrah time, when everybody was going secret, <laughs> they were traveling to Medina, they're going secretly. They don't want to be uh, uh, caught yeah. when they're traveling. Umar radiallahu an. He gets himself ready, he, ca he gets his, uh, his zuwar, his food and stuff, and he cuts his sword with him. And he goes out in the, in the center of Mecca. <laughs> and he calls the people. He says, قال, من شاء أن تذكله أمه فلحق في هذا الوادي. <laughs> if anyone desires his mom to lose him, let him follow me in this valley. <laughs> like, meet me in this valley. <laughs> like, he is going opposite. I'm Muhajir, I'm leaving. If anyone wants to die, follow me. Right? What kind of man is that, subhanAllah? The kind of yeah. level of trust and iman and yaqeen that he has in his heart. But that same man with such bravery, he was, yes, he was sometimes seen as being tough in the discipline that he created for the ummah. Right. But his heart, his softness, his care, oh. his, his empathy for the ummah is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like one time he was, he was walking and he has haiba. People, they, they, they fear him when, when, they, when he walks. So one day he was walking and then people, they were walking behind him. And as you know, you kind of walk like an entourage, but they slow down. They don't want to be, come too close. So sometimes as he was, he would be walking, he suddenly turns around to the people. <laughs> that they freak out. And he's like, <gasps> and they go like, Arabtani Amir al Mu'minin. Oh my God, you scared us off. It was bil haq and bil batal. Was it that for, with the truth or the falsehood? He goes, na bil haq, wallahi. He goes, zadini Allahu haybatan fi qulubikum then. Allahu Akbar. If that's going to cause you to see the truth, then may Allah increase that fear in your heart. Like to that level, radiallahu anhu wa But that same man, that same man, subhanAllah, who uh, Allah gave him power. He became like the king of the entire world of that time. Shaykh. The most powerful man in the world. Absolutely, the most powerful man in the world. The riches of the world became under his, and his care and his control. Persia, for example, was completely destroyed under his care. All of this, subhanAllah. And then still though, when he, was, when he was so concerned for the believers who were fighting in the battlefield that every single day he would wait outside of Medina, waiting for the barid, which means the male. Back then, the male, they created the system, the, the, uh, the, the horseman system, that we ran quickly in one day to get the male to Umar al Khattab. So one of those days, he was sleeping out there in the desert under the shade of a tree, using his clock as his pillow. And when the, when the emissary and the envoy from the Persian Empire came looking for Umar, they brought him to Umar al Khattab. So they took him outside and they, he looks at Umar radiallahu anh sleeping and he's wearing normal clothes, no entourage, no guards, nobody. He looks at him and just like, so amazed and mesmerized. Like, this is Umar? This is the one who uh, shook the whole world? Like, this guy? Hakamta. Yeah, but he said his, those beautiful statements where he goes, قال, Hakamta, fa'adalta, fa'aminta, fa'nimta ya Umar. You ruled, and you did justice, so you felt safe to go and have a sweet sleep, you know, Ya Umar. No doubt about it. Like with justice, you find that peace, SubhanAllah. But again, I'm, I can't stop talking about Umar Khattab. Last one, inshallah ta'ala. One of those most beautiful things uh, that reminds me of Umar radiallahu anhu wa rda, when the, the victory in al Qadisiyah, uh, the news arrived, and he'd been waiting for the news all, this, all these days, because it took, a, it took very long for the battle to continue until it was over, subhanAllah. So Umar ibn Khattab was waiting outside, obviously. So the man who was bringing the good news to the Khalifa, 
he was going on his camel, he wants to go and give the good news, the glad time to the Khalifa first, to Umar Khattab. Umar sees him from afar. He chased after him. He goes, Yarhamukallah, wait for me. Just wait, please. Did we win or lose? He goes, I'm sorry, I have to go and, and, and give the, the, the glad time to the Khalifa, to Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he's Amir al-Mu'mineen. But he didn't want to tell him that. And the man kept going faster, and the Umar calling him, please wait, wait, tell me, what happened? Until subhanAllah, when they arrived into Medina, and the man now slowing down, trying to see where the Khalifa is, is staying, the people, as they were walking the streets, uh, seeing Umar behind them, and they say, Assalamu alaikum, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Assalamu alaikum, Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he's like, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu <laughs> And the man is just looking, where's Amir al-Mu'mineen? <laughs> and he looks behind him, the, the guy who was chasing after him, catching his breath. <laughs> And he goes, Anta Amir al-Mu'mineen, Yarhamukallah. Why don't you tell me so? <laughs> I could have waited for you. He goes, no, no, you're fine, you're fine. It's okay, tell me what happened. And he gave him the good news. So he takes him home to feed him. What food Umar had, subhanAllah, to feed that guest? Nothing. All, olive oil, salt, and bread. And he started asking him, tell me more. What happened? Whom did we lose? This and that. So he said to him, we lost this person and that person, this person, by name. He goes, they were, they were martyred on the battlefield. And then he says something profound. He goes, قَالْ وَأُنَاسٌ آخرون. And many, many others, Amir al-Mu'mineen don't know about them. That broke Umar's heart. It really brought him to tears. He goes, what matters? What matters يعني, about Umar knowing them or not if Allah, the Lord of Umar, knows who, who they are? It's like the 30,000 casualty count, the 40,000 from Gaza. No. What are their names? Their numbers right now, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter if we don't know them when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know these people. So tying it to the subjects of istiqamah, Shaykh, like Umar was really like the manifestation of this. Right. And he is not a prophet. He's not a messenger of God. So he's not ma'soom, infallible. But he, subhanAllah, like you said, he upgraded himself in his ta'a, in his ibadah, in his yaqeen, his certainty to the level that he becomes the manifestation of istiqamah, that the shaitan doesn't even dare walk on his path. From the moment he became Muslim to the moment he died, you can see a traceable form of progress at the individual level, mm. at the level of governance, no. spirituality, in every single year of his life. It's he kept getting better and better and better and better. More spiritual refinement, more spiritual refinement. Like subhanAllah, initially, um, you know, when you think of Umar radiallahu anhu, and that was a fear. It's one of the, my, my, subhanAllah, the way these companions had like a few words uh, to, to describe someone. One of the fears when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was appointing Umar to be Khalifa radiallahu anhu is that he's going to be too tough. He's going to be too tough. He was tough on himself, right? He wasn't unjust to others. He was tough on himself. And Uthman described him in the following way. When Abu Bakr asked Uthman about Umar, Uthman radiallahu anhu praised him and said, and what people don't know about him is even better than what people know about him. So like the good qualities that everyone knows about him are not only there publicly, they're even better if people knew what he was like privately. And so as the Khalifa, the spiritual maturity, the compassion, the care, never losing that, that fire for justice, he doesn't wrong a donkey and his ummah. He won't let a donkey or a child, a Muslim, non-Muslim, probably even a, the old Jewish man, when Umar anhu saw an old Jewish man and he was begging on the street, he said, so what happened to you? What, what's going on here? And you know, he, he said, you know, it's, it's just become too difficult. And, and Umar anhu was like weeping, like, you know, we took advantage, we use you in your youth and we're not taking care of you in your old age. He's like, no, we got to take care of these people. Non-Muslims, Muslims, humans, animals. He never let his fire for justice make him you know, callous or cruel. He just keeps getting better and better and better. And I think, Shaykh, the way we can end it, subhanAllah, on istiqama, the most beautiful thing you can hear about a man, and you know, a person's life is by their end. May Allah grant us a good ending. Allahumma ameen. Ameen. With all of those lofty achievements, like if Umar radiallahu had a trophy shelf, that'd be the most loaded trophy shelf. And with all of those achievements, when his head is in his son's lap as he's dying, he says, oh my son, put my head in the dirt so that perhaps when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees me returning to him, he'll have mercy on me. I want to die humble. Put my head in the dirt. Like don't even keep my head on your, on your lap. SubhanAllah, what type, of, what type of faith is that? What type of istiqamah is that? Like that's, 
I'm not, I'm not trying to meet Allah with my chest out. I know I've got flaws, and I've been working on them my whole life. So let me meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a man whose head is in the dirt, as a man who was trying until the very last moment. That's why he is who he is. You know, Shaykh, one of the, of course, um, I would say endorsement of his character, and I would say, subhanAllah, like a, a badge that was given to him as an award and reward for what he's done, is radiallahu ta'ala anha ummu mu'minin Aisha. Aisha, when she sacrificed something very precious for her, to give it to Umar radiallahu anha, the space where he's buried right now. Because in her room, she yeah. had the Prophet saw some her husband, his hus- her husband buried there. And then her father, when he passed, he wanted to be buried next to his friend. So they did put them next to each other. And there was only one, one space left for a grave. And she wanted this to be for her. To be hers, to be next to her husband and her dad. When Umar was injured and he was stabbed, and he knew that it was the moment. So he said permission, he sent, sent somebody to Aisha, seek permission from her. Can I take permission, your permission to be buried next to my, uh, my friends? And Aisha, no hesitation. She goes, absolutely. Can you imagine she was saving that spot for herself to be in that place, subhanAllah. But when Umar came and, and she said, you earned it, absolutely no hesitation. She gave it to him, radiallahu anhu. Wallahi, every time I go to Medina and, and visit, subhanAllah, the Masjid of Rasulullah, sallallahu and just walk that walk and see, and knowing that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar al-Khattam, Rasulullah, in that, in that place, what an unbelievable journey. What an unbelievable story, subhanAllah, of righteousness and istiqamah. It's just the manifestation of all of it, just symbolism of it happens. Shows there. you the U-turn. He started off wanting yeah, to kill yeah, the Prophet, yeah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He ended off being buried next to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Talk about a U-turn in life. And that's istiqamah, right? It's not just guidance. It's after committing to guidance. It's not just the zeal of the initial moment. It's the commitment that comes with that zeal. That, that we all seek Allah, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's favor and we seek his his blessing so that we could be able to walk that path too may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all istiqamah Ameen. and by the way that's a dua Sheikh Yasser mashallah has been teaching the dua every day after Asr Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah when he would read the ayah فَاسْتَقَمْ كِمَا أُمِرْتُ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكِ he would say Allahumma anta rabbuna farzuqna al-istiqamah mm. oh Allah you are our Lord so grant us istiqamah so just say Allahumma rzuqna al-istiqamah ask mm. Allah for istiqamah ask Allah for steadfastness just as you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Ma. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all istiqamah, Rabbil Alameen. So the first question here that uh, people, they ask about istiqamah, like I'm being inconsistent with it. Like uh, inconsistent with istiqamah, like I find myself, alhamdulillah, in those moments, my heart is in it and I feel myself motivated and then I go a mile or two on the path of istiqamah and then suddenly, I don't know, I just seems that I'm going to keep going, getting off that straight path. What's, what's going on here, Sheikh? So you know, you do strength training initially in certain ideal conditions. Here you're doing spiritual strength training so that eventually when you're actually in the elements, you can handle the elements. But you have to develop that spiritual muscle. Uh, The masjid, Ramadan, the Quran, the, the companionship of righteous people, all of that is where you build your spiritual muscle, right? So that you can weather the elements when you get put back into the elements. And those are the people, and it was ironically enough, Umar radiallahu anhu commented on the verse, mm. They are the ones who Allah tested their hearts for piety. Mm. And he said, the one who is tested <clears throat> and succeeds is better than the one who is not tested. You know, meaning, by the way, let this be a glad tiding to you, O Muslim who lives as a stranger in a difficult environment. That Muslim that grows up in a Muslim country Everyone, everything and everyone around them tells them to be a good Muslim. They don't really ever, they never feel, the, the, you know, being ostracized for being Muslim or being the outsider or being the stranger because everyone around them is Muslim and everything around them is Muslim. And so it's not really that hard, right? Umar radiallahu anhu was saying that the one who's tested and succeeds is better than the one who's not tested in the first place. That's what the ayah means. They are the ones who Allah tested their hearts. For taqwa. You see, you've been using Ramadan. Fasting was prescribed upon you so that you could develop God consciousness. But Allah says, there are some people I test for God consciousness. I test their hearts with that God consciousness. So you build that muscle in Ramadan, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you, puts you through the test to see if that taqwa is actually there. And if you got knocked over, if you crashed, 
Again, there's no salvage title on your soul. There's no distance that is too large between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just come back. So the inconsistency means put yourself in a consistent environment until you can handle inconsistent elements more often. No. That means you need to be really, really you know, dedicated to creating a consistent connection to the masjid, a consistent connection to a halaqa, a consistent connection to good friends, a consistent so connection. That's, that's part of the question someone asking practical tips on, on, on to stay on the path of istiqamah. So what you're saying right now, what we suggest for them? The consistency of you know, being with friends and Make message. every structure around you as consistent as possible until your heart can be more consistent. No. Um, Sheikh, many people they say here that when it comes to the subject of istiqamah, um, it, what's, what's the, the level where you believe that, alhamdulillah, you have a, a, a good level that makes you feel comfortable you're on the straight path? Is there any moment no. that you can make you feel <laughs> this is it? You're never complacent. That's the thing. So what, what made Umar radiallahu anhu so consistent was that he was always worried. Mm. So it wasn't like, well, since shaitan's not on my path, I'm just going to be okay. No, it's like, no, there's always a potential of him getting right back in there. If I weaken in my pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then shaitan will find a willing buyer to his market. So eventually he'll just start calling me back to it. So you're never complacent, but you never despair. You're never complacent, but you never despair. You always know that you have the possibility to fail, but you have a Lord who wants you to succeed. And so you mm. keep depositing, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. But at the same time, you're never too complacent. You're never too comfortable because you know that once upon a time, Shaytan was up in the heavens. And look where he fell to. May Allah protect us. A question, Sheikh, about social support. It says, like over here, how do we find accountability group with a group of small friends or with shuyukh and murabbis to, be, to have istiqamah in every way so we can uh, keep the course? So look, there are some people and even some people that are watching SubhanAllah that live in remote towns. Like we get these messages that come in like from people that don't have a masjid within 90 miles of them. Oh. It's really interesting SubhanAllah. Like we literally get messages from people on islands. <laughs> um, I was going to mention one email that I got today, but SubhanAllah I'll just leave it. But it was, it was crazy because I, it just like people live in these remote areas and they're connecting online to these things and it's giving them something. So look, be conscious of Allah as much as you can. If you can't connect to a physical structure, connect to a digital structure. If you can't connect to a large group of people, connect to one or two people, mm. right? Uh, there's one thing about Islam not having that spiritual hierarchy. You don't have to have a sheikh that's with you all the time, that's telling you how to make toba, make toba this way or make toba through me. You don't have a priest, right? So you just got to have like two or three good brothers, two or three good sisters that you keep up with and they keep up with you and you hold each other accountable. And I always tell people, subhanAllah, and we, we talked about this early on, that one of the ailments of the time is that people don't challenge each other because they don't want to lose them as friends. Mm. Your best friend is someone who cares more about you than your friendship. Yep. And so they'll give you hard truths in the best way possible. They don't want to alienate you on purpose, but they'll give you hard truths because that's what you need to hear. And tawasal bil haqqi wa tawasal bil sabr. You're not going to get, you're, you're not going to get like nasiha in the comments section of a social media post. It's not going to really hit you that way. Okay? But a one-on-one -on -one with someone that you trust wants good for you, if they give me a hard truth, I welcome it. And that's the blessing, subhanAllah, like, look, Umar needed Abu Bakr. Umar needed, not just the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr and Umar had this beautiful relationship. They fought sometimes, like good brothers do. Right? They had arguments. They fought. By the way, one series, one day I'm going to do it, inshallah, is Bain Abi Bakr wa Umar. All the narrations of Abu Bakr and Umar. Maybe when I finish the first, I'm just going to do that for a long time. Because you could literally, you could find like hundreds of narrations of like the most, the smallest things. They're eating together. They get into an argument with each other. They make up. They reconcile. They, try, they praise each other. They get mad at each other again. That's what good brothers do, right? So subhanAllah, you need that brother. You need that sister. You need someone to be that accountability partner. It doesn't have to be a whole community. <coughs> Obviously, all of these things are to promote virtue in society and to help keep us grounded. But you just need that, you, you need those two or three people that are in your life, inshallah ta'ala, you try to connect to them. And alhamdulillah, one of the blessings of the internet, it is actually a blessing, alhamdulillah, 
One of the blessings of the internet is that it's connected so many people to a community of faith that otherwise would be completely isolated from it. No. And we hear this all the time. The types of people that become Muslim and that stay Muslim that don't see a masjid for the first one or two years of being Muslim. Like, that story sounds crazy, but I actually know people like that. That in the first year or two of being Muslim, like, they physically could not access a masjid because of how far away it was. But they learned Salah, they learned Siyam, they, they learned their religion, they, they learned how to read the Qur'an, they made use of these things. And that shows you, and, and you know, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَانَا We talked about this ayah. Those who try, will make it happen for them. This is another way to look at the verse. Those that strive in our path, we will open the pathways for them. Sometimes that pathway is going to be digital. Sometimes that pathway is going to be from a place you didn't expect. Allah will provide for you from places that you didn't expect. So pathways open up to come close to Allah. But if you try, Allah will help you. Allah will open up doors for you if you try to seek Him. And that's really the way that, that we start to think creatively in this world that we live in. How do we find those pathways back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So a question he says that if uh, it's impossible to become like a prophet, is it possible to, be, to become like a sahabi? I want to comment on this if it's okay, Shaykh. So, yeah. so um, wanting to be like a sahabi. Here's the thing. First of all, a sahabi radiallahu ta'ala no matter how much you try, no matter how much you try, you would never, ever be able to surpass their reward for being Sahaba. Because they brought to us something we could never compensate them for. And that is to strive and struggle when it was extremely difficult and hard. At the beginning of the establishment of faith, they put all the sacrifice for us to enjoy today, 1400 years later, to say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. As the Prophet says, if you go to spend the, the, the size of the amount of Uhud in gold, you wouldn't even come close to the little of handful of, of deeds that they do. So in that, in that perspective. So we can never surpass them at that level. However, we also need to know that the Prophet has given us hope when he says, Laytani alqa ikhwani. I wish I can live long enough to meet my brothers. Another narration says, Qal ahbabi, my beloved ones. As Sahaba, they looked at him, Qalu Rasulullah, alasna ahbabak, alasna ikhwanak. Don't you consider us your brothers? Don't you consider us your, your, your loved ones? Qal antum ashabi, you're my companions. Like, you got your share, you got your reward for it. You have the ranks already. Qal walakin ahbabi or ikhwani, my, my beloved ones, my brothers, are those who will come after me, believing in me, even though they've never seen me. He said, their reward for what they do will be double of what you do. So one of the Sahabi came and said, Ya Rasulullah, you mean one of them? He goes, no, one of you. Like, you're getting double the reward for what the Sahaba are already, they, they did. Why is that? Because what we do today for us is ghaib. We're doing it based on what? Based on belief, really, and conviction. They saw the Prophet, they saw the evidence, they saw the proof, they had visuals for the reality of the, of the faith itself and the life of the Prophet So you might say it was easier for them to, to comply and follow, but for you, you guys just trust the word and, and, and you follow that. So you're still having so much reward, alhamdulillah, for what you do. It's way higher than the reward that Sahaba used to get back then. However, no matter what we do, we will never surpass that level of the Sahaba for the biggest sacrifice they've done. The other thing as well too, is that a Sahaba themselves, we have to also keep in mind, they were different ranks, meaning not all of them were ulama, scholars, not all of them were huffad of the Quran, not all of them were at that level. So you have the Bedouin who just come to the Prophet and he says, look, salah, fasting, hajj, that's it. I'm not gonna add, I'm not gonna take anything away from that. Is that okay for me? The Prophet says, if you, if you tell the truth, if you hold on to this, you'll be successful. I mean, that's considered sahabi. Right? Sheikh, you know what my, my, my first halaqa on Tuesday is going to be? No. Abu Sufyan. Allah, Allah. I was going to name it the curious case of Abu Sufyan. Subhanallah. Because his whole biography is trying to undermine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and somehow the man dies a Muslim. Subhanallah. Like there's like no chapters of his time in Islam, except like his whole time trying to, but somehow, subhanAllah, Allah Not just a Muslim, Sheikh, also a leader in Islam, even, yeah. subhanAllah. But the idea is that Sahaba, not all of them at the same rank. So yeah, some people who came after the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they probably surpassed the Sahaba in terms of knowledge, or some of the Sahaba in terms of knowledge of the deen, really. Because they learned from Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Thabit, this and that. 
uh, not like the other Sahaba who just kept living their lives normally. However, again, don't you ever try to compare yourself to any Sahabi to the, of the least of the Sahaba. Because their reward and their privilege and their ranks as being Sahaba is way higher than anything you can imagine of yourself. But you can still do a lot, inshallah ta'ala. But one most interesting thing. Can you become better than angels? Yes, Masha, that's a very bold answer, man. Radiallahu <laughs> anka. Like seriously, if you cannot surpass the Sahabi, how about the angels? Can you? You guys went quiet. What's going on here? We had a whole chapter on this. Ibn al said Ibn Qayyim, Rah Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he answered this question. He goes, look, in essence, in essence, the angels are way better than human beings, of course. There's no comparison. Like in terms of the creation itself, there's, they're way better. They never sin. They never do anything wrong. They always obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah described them in the Quran, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They never disobey Allah, whatever he commands them. So they fulfill the commandments. But here's where it comes, what becomes better for the human beings. Ibn mean, Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he says, يعني, in this dunya, yeah, the angels are uh, probably better than, than us human beings. But in the akhirah, probably some humans will surpass the grades of angels. Why is that? Because the ibadah of the angels was what? Was not optional for them. They didn't have a choice in it. But for the believers, when you abandon all these desires and you abandon all these fitan like Umar and did subhanahu and upgrade yourself from Islam to Iman to Ihsan, the huge sacrifice when the drive to do otherwise is even strong and probably stronger and you still chose the path of guidance that would qualify some people on the day of judgment to probably perhaps surpass some of the grades and the ranks of the angels. May Allah make us among them. Shaykh, you also now. have the ayah, Ma'an Right? So with the prophets, with the truthful ones, as siddiqeen and then the martyrs, the shuhada, and the righteous ones, the salihin. Uh, each one of these ranks is greater than the one after it to some, in some ways. So every one of these is, is a salih, is a righteous person, right? May Allah make us from the salihin. Allah Amen. Amen. But the siddiqeen the highest trait of the companions is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. As Siddiq, the truthful one. And we have the ability to be Siddiqeen, meaning to gain the quality of the best companion, and hence, as a category of people, gain that rank. The Siddiq is independent of circumstance because he's always going to show that he was truthful. So, whether Allah tests him with a situation where he's going to lose his life, he's going to be a Shaheed. He's going to live up to that, that shahada. Or Allah spares him and puts him in a situation where he tests him with his desires. He's going to win that battle over his desires because he's truthful in his pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a Siddiq is the highest category after a prophet and you can aim for that. And that's why the ayah doesn't say a nabiyin wa sahaba wa siddiqeen wa No, aim for being a Siddiq. Aim for the highest level and that is to be a person of Sidq. May Allah make us truthful in our pursuit of him. Amen. I if somebody insisting to know what is my epic routine? My, what's my routine for my epic beard? What should I tell this person, Yani? Tell him the truth, man. Tell the truth? Tell him the truth. <laughs> the truth is, where's Abu Ahmad? Is he here? <laughs> Abu Ahmad, Muhammad, where is he? We just watched it happen live. It was, it was, it was, it was a sight to see. <laughs> Sheikh has a whole, like, you talk about privileges, man. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Hey man, come on. He's got a guy that grooms his beard every single night, mashallah. I was like, what is going on here? Hasad. Mashallah. Mashallah. You want me to read on your beard, Sheikh? <laughs> no, seriously. Brother Muhammad Allah, brother, mashallah. He, has, he, he owns uh, uh, Fades, his uh, uh, barber shop or barber active services. Uh, the beginning of the end of uh, the last uh, uh, 10 nights, he came to me and says, You're not going to go at your own screen without fixing your beard. <laughs> I'm like, Man, don't do this, please. He goes, No, I'm going to have to do it every single night. So he brings his bag and he fixes it in the office before I come out over here. So if you need your beard fixed, Bismillah, talk to him, inshallah. Zakallah you should run an ad on the bottom of the, of the stream too. Right, right, huh? Commercial. A commercial for me, yeah. yeah so, Muhammad will be back, inshallah. Ta'ala. <laughs> <laughs> Final advice, Sheikh. We want to conclude this, this series with a, a, a serious note, inshallah, to Barakah Wata. People carry with them with delight to Barakah Wata for the rest of the year until uh, um, next Ramadan. Because I know a lot of people that keep demanding, saying, hey guys, please keep doing this once a month. You know, keep doing this uh, series, one more series, inshallah. And I, I, 
I know that, alhamdulillah, there's a huge demand on these beautiful spiritual sessions, but sometimes the value of it in Ramadan is, is unique, really. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, the anticipation to the next year in itself is much more probably motivating for you to keep uh, on the straight path than having it much more regular. So your final advice to our brothers and sisters before we conclude this series, inshallah ta'ala. Love Allah and your desires will have less pull. Love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you won't fall to the trends of the day. Love the righteous and you'll never desire the company of the wicked again. From, from my side, my advice really is never ever cease to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how distant you think yourself from Allah azza wa jalla, never ever lose hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if the shaitan can win this from you, this is it. If he can win this from you, that you're not, you're not deserving Allah's rahmah, Allah's mercy, Allah's forgiveness, then this is it. That's what he wants, that you lose that moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So never, ever cease to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you would like to have that very intimate, private communication and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then wake up 10 minutes, 15 minutes before Fajr Adhan. Do that. If you truly believe that this is something that you need, that you desire, that you truly, your heart craving regularly because I really want to have those moments with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what's stopping you? What is stopping you from waking up 10, 15 minutes every single day before Fajr just for the sake of having those beautiful, sweet moments with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala when you tell him, my Lord, I bring all my burden to you and I seek your forgiveness. Ya Allah, forgive me. Can you imagine having that opportunity every single night? And during the time of Saha, the pre-dawn hour, they wake up and seek Allah's forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us our best deed, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our Ramadan, Ya Allah. We ask Allah to conclude this Ramadan for us with rahmah and mercy and forgiveness, Ya Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who will be witness of Al Qadr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to write us among those who witness Al Qadr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to help us seal this month of Ramadan with the best of our deeds, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among those who dua was accepted, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask in this very special moment as we come to conclude this month of Ramadan. And as we come to conclude the last night of the month of Ramadan, Ya Allah, we ask that you accept at the best of our deeds, Ya Rabbil Alameen. That you overlook our mistakes, our sins, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to cure our hearts from all the disease of the heart, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you to fill our hearts with love and mercy for one another, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you to remove any ill feelings from our hearts towards any believer, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And fill our hearts with love and mercy, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Rabbi. We ask in this very special moment, the way we all gather in this place, we gather together in Jannah al al A'la. With the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ya Allah, we ask you for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Allah. Be there for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, deliver them out of, that, out of that situation, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Bring them justice, Ya Allah. Bring them justice, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, protect them from the harm that's been imposed upon them, Ya Allah. Ya Rabbi, provide for them when everybody deprive them of your, of your rahmah and your mercy, Ya Allah. We ask that you provide for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, accept their shuhada. We ask you to, to heal the wounded among them. And bring those that are absent, Ya Allah, and have mercy on those, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Feed them from your rizq, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Provide them from your rizq, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you in this very special time to protect this jama'ah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Protect our jama'ah, protect our community, protect our students, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our hearts with rahmah and, and tranquility in this dunya and together in the akhirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, alhamdulillah. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته